Hi folks, this is Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove and this is the workshop on revolution of values. I'm uh, glad to have this chance to share with you from a book that I published this year. It's called Revolution of Values, Reclaiming Public Faith for the Common Good. And uh, we are obviously here in October in the midst of the last days of uh, an election season which has gone on for some time and no doubt will continue uh, for uh, at least several days after November 3rd as we make sure all the votes are counted uh, during this pandemic. But in the midst of this, particularly for those of you who are pastors, for those of you who are in faith communities, I wanted to share um, about this book and why I wrote it. Um, it's for me uh, this has been a kind of a lifelong journey to understand where I came from and what happened to uh, the nation that I live in but um, particularly my own faith tradition in the midst of um, the political storm that rages about us these days uh, so let me begin by uh, giving you a little bit of my own story I was born in 1980 and a little town in rural North Carolina, just down the road from Mayberry. Um, some of you have probably seen the Andy Griffith Show. They tell me that uh, five or six million people still watch it every day on reruns. Um, but I uh, was born uh, into a family that my, actually my great grandmother grew up in the same town as Andy Griffith and uh, our family's only real claim to fame is that um, when Andy went off and told the story about his little hometown, he he uh, didn't change the names of all the characters, and so our uncle Otis made it into the Andy Griffith Show uh, as the the town drunk who let himself in and out of the jail. But that was um, uh, that world, that world of rural North Carolina, of uh, people who farmed and ran small businesses and uh, knew one another and went to church together on. Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, that's the world I grew up in. And when I was born in 1980, as I have come to uh, understand after the fact, uh, Ronald Reagan had just been elected with the support of the moral majority. And that moral majority, which was uh, greatly encouraged and empowered by that election, uh, by a president who said to them, um, uh, I know that you can't endorse me, but I endorse you, uh, in his famous phrase. Uh, that marked a moment when the community that I was growing up in became a very clear target of an organized campaign to recruit uh, people of faith, particularly white people of faith in the South, in the suburbs, and across the Sun Belt of this country to be part of a voting coalition and we were told that that coalition was about biblical values and traditional values. We were told that it was about being pro-life and about voting our conscious conscience in public life. Um, and as an earnest kid growing up in that context, I wanted to do all that I could for Jesus. And so I made it my goal to uh, become uh, the President of the United States. That was what I was trying to do when I was in junior high school. I uh, got up early every morning and uh, did my Bible study and did my push-ups because I wanted to go to the Naval Academy so that I could uh, get to know the sort of people that I would need to climb the uh, political ladder. And um, I was very sad to learn as a young person that you had to already have a recommendation from a senator to go to the Naval Academy. Um, it it, it uh, was my first glimpse into the incredibly insulated world of the political elite in this country. But I did have a, a grandfather who drove a Greyhound bus, and he gave me a ride to Washington, D.C. when I had a long weekend off of school. And uh, I went to the U.S. Senate, into the public gallery, the chambers uh, that were a bit more open at that time. And when I went in there on a normal weekday while the Senate was in session, I looked down onto the floor and there were young people like me who were running around in blue blazers. And I asked the security guard who was standing there who those people were. And he told me they were Senate pages, 
So I uh, went home to the library and did a little research and found out um, what I needed to do to become a Senate page. And so as a 16-year-old, um, I uh, got appointed to uh, Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina's office and went to D.C. as a page. My family took me and got me a suit, and I uh, lived in the dormitory for the pages on Capitol Hill, got up early and did my Bible study and my push-ups and my schoolwork before uh, the offices opened at 9 a.m. so that I could be there in the bustle of it all and could feel like I was on my way to a political career. It was a, a heady time and an exciting time, and in the midst of that, uh, my eyes were opened to the uh, practical realities of politics and what really happens in senators' offices and on Capitol Hill. I uh, be began to see that the language that was used to talk to people back home was not the same language that people used, uh, and that in many ways, the concern about biblical and traditional values uh, didn't translate into regularly returning to the scriptures as a guide for what we were doing, but a lot more of life was about protecting the interests of uh, military contractors and corporate elites and the lobbyists who came in and out of the offices every day. It was a disillusioning experience for me, but one that uh, I think was critically important, especially as a teenager. And I'll never forget one particular experience as I was going down to Union Station to get lunch one day. Uh, I passed a man who was on the street begging. He had a cup and was asking if I could spare some change. And I ignored the man. I ignored him because um, I had all sorts of stories I had been told about people like him, people who were uh, gaming the system, who were uh, um, uh, not pulling their load. Uh, I, I had been given these categories of the deserving poor and the undeserving poor and had been told that uh, uh, responding in that situation could only enable uh, people who were not willing to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. I, I didn't think much about it. It was, it, was, it was all in my head and in my habits. But as I got to the door of Union Station after I had passed that man, I heard Jesus speak to me. And uh, Jesus spoke in the language of the scriptures that I had been taught and had memorized in the Sunday school back home, uh, the same place where biblical values were instilled into me. We memorized it in the King James Version, and Jesus said, Inasmuch as ye did not do it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye did not do it unto me. And if my people taught me anything, they taught me that when Jesus speaks, you have to listen. So I turned around and went back and found that man. I apologized to him and gave him what I had at the time. I, I didn't do much else. Uh, I didn't take a lot of time to listen to him, but, uh, but I realized, looking back, that that moment was an interruption, a place where I realized that there was a conflict between what the Sunday school teachers had taught me and what I was learning in the habits and the practices of uh, life in the religious right, life on Capitol Hill. For me personally, that was the beginning of the end of my political career and the beginning of a journey to go back and read the scriptures again. Since 2016, uh, I have talked to many people all across this country who have uh, had a similar experience. Uh, you know, as I do, the numbers that say something like 80 or 81 percent of white evangelicals supported Donald Trump in 2016. Uh, this was a uh, deeply concerning issue for many black and brown evangelicals who understood the um, racist appeal uh, of um, build that wall or of uh, the call to take our country back. Um, maybe even more concerning than that number, though, is that a majority of white Christians across the board uh, were willing to go along with this um, uh, increasingly divisive and fear-driven campaign that um, was deeply rooted 
in that history of the alliance between political conservatives, reactionary political conservatives, and uh, certain forms of white Christianity. And that has led me to uh, go back and look more closely at how this alliance came to be, at not only how I was recruited into a movement, but how that movement uh, uh, enmeshed itself in many of our church structures, uh, not just white evangelical churches, but Pentecostal and independent churches, in uh, Catholic churches, and in many ways in the consciousness of the nation and in the way we talk about religion in our public life. What I've tried to do in the book um, Revolution of Values is issue by issue when we talk about the the things that matter in public life, issues like poverty and the environment, uh, women's rights and uh, um, immigrant rights, immigration issues, uh, when we talk about uh, the military and uh, how we fund the military, when we talk about uh, ecological destruction and the climate crisis that we face, issue after issue, the, the kinds of things that we're all talking about as we discuss who we're going to vote for in this coming election. Um, the religious right organized itself uh, to shape people's uh, reading of scripture and values uh, to support a very reactionary conservatism, a reactionary conservatism that in some cases uh, was uh, willing to deny and uh, create uh, disinformation uh, uh, to um, push back against uh, the, the just facts of science, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the climate crisis that we face. How did that happen? Where did that come from? That's the one question that I wanted to address with this book. And so as the uh, book goes chapter by chapter, issue by issue, I narrate that history. And um, there are lots of really important voices that have been doing historical and journalistic work that uh, help me do that. Um, I'd recommend to you uh, the work on Christian nationalism by the sociologists uh, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. Uh, their new book is called Taking America Back for God. Uh, journalists like Catherine Stewart and Ann Nelson and Sarah Posner, all of whom have published books in the last year, year and a half, on Christian nationalism have done a lot to highlight the institutions and the networks that um, made this uh, such a dominant uh, voice in our public life. But I think the key thing that I think it's essential for church people to understand is that the origins of this movement were really a reaction against the gains of the civil and women and human rights movements of the 1960s and 70s. Those movements, which had an incredible amount of support, in, a visible support from uh, moral leadership, um, think about the role of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King or Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, very visible religious voices who were um, out front in those movements speaking clearly about these issues as moral issues. It's not to say that all of the churches and synagogues and uh, uh, clergy and laity got on board with those movements, but, but in public life it was a, there was a clear understanding that there was a moral voice speaking to this broad range of issues. And in reaction against that, there were some political operatives in the 1970s, members of uh, what was called the New Right, the uh, reaction against um, the uh, Johnson administration and the uh, progressive policies that uh, had come along with the war on poverty, with the immigration and Nationalization Act, um, with expansions of equal protection under the law and the possibility of an Equal Rights Amendment uh, passing uh, uh, and being added to the U.S. Constitution. All of those things together created a reactionary movement of people who understood 
that they needed moral authority in order to uh, hold on to power. And so they reached out to uh, clergy, uh, particularly to Jerry Falwell, um, who had already been politicized in Virginia by the uh, movement to resist Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, one of the stories I tell in the book is how uh, Jerry Falwell cut his political teeth on uh, joining uh, as a chaplain the local resistance group in Lynchburg that was going to, uh, um, uh, in response to the Brown decision, uh, have what, they, what the governor at that time called and what that movement called massive resistance, massive resistance to desegregation. They literally shut down public schools for some time in the state of Virginia in, in order to try to keep Brown, the decision from the highest court in the land from being implemented there in the state of Virginia. Uh, of course, that didn't last, but the resistance did last. And uh, Falwell, uh, who came to believe that uh, his uh, indignation against this uh, federal effort to challenge the segregation of his community was um, righteous. He um, came to believe that it uh, threatened the values of uh, families and of the community, the white community that he had grown up in and pastored, and to such a degree that he was willing to start a private Christian academy, an all-white Christian academy at his church, the Liberty Christian Academy, that um, that was a segregation academy to defy the uh, desegregation of the public schools there in Virginia. The uh, political operatives of the New Right who recognized this as a tradition that they could tap into also understood that in the United States at the time that the consensus, the broad consensus, uh, had moved toward uh, recognizing that the civil rights movement was indeed correct. And so uh, the issue of segregation was not a winning issue to build a broad coalition. However, they did come to believe that these same people who had organized in a reactionary way against desegregation could be organized around a call for uh, resistance to the uh, expansions of women's rights tied to the Roe v. Wade decision and to the uh, Equal Rights Amendment, uh, that they could uh, present that as a threat to life and to the family, and that they could uh, build out a reactionary political force that would cast itself not as uh, anti-civil uh, rights, but as pro-life and pro-family. And that is the origin of uh, the religious right. Uh, Ann Nelson's work that I mentioned, I think, is critically important because she uh, knits together the, the players who were there from the very beginning, uh, people uh, who had uh, cut their teeth in the um, uh, reclaiming of power and control within the Southern Baptist Convention, joining with these political operatives from the new right, joining with um, those folks who were uh, at that time using the NRA for a very similar purpose and connecting with um, independent media and uh, uh, school networks uh, all through something called the Council for National Policy. This uh, begins the uh, long-term investment of hundreds of millions of dollars by uh, people who had a vested interest in maintaining power and control in public life, in uh, reducing uh, taxes on their corporate earnings, in uh, perpetuating their uh, uh, oil and gas uh, reserves and investments, and the potential uh, to make money through those in an international market, uh, all of those things come together uh, in a way that I think uh, Donald Trump um, summarizes uh, whenever he says 
uh, to, as he calls them, his evangelicals, that um, if he does not remain in power, that there will be no more guns, there will be no more oil, there will be no more God. Uh, in many ways, there's not a more succinct um, summary of the coalition that was built and that has uh, uh, spent an incredible amount of money trying to shape public imagination in the United States and the imagination of Christians to believe that the only issues that matter are uh, issues of uh, private morality, uh, issues of uh, human sexuality, and of uh, abortion, and their particular uh, narrow reading of what it means to be pro-life with regard to Roe v. Wade. This is the um, world that I was saying that uh, I was groomed in and cultivated in without even knowing it. I, it, it wasn't that my uh, people and folks like them had sat down and read the scriptures and, and somehow discerned uh, that the kernel, that the heart of the whole matter was that we um, uh, needed to uh, uh, try to overturn uh, a Supreme Court decision from 1973. No, it was that, that the money uh, that had been invested in free literature and in uh, retreats for pastors and in training programs and in uh, campaigns that would come around every election cycle to uh, reinforce this narrative that would put it on independent radio stations and Christian radio stations that would tie that with the message on Fox News and the Salem Media Network, that this whole wraparound culture was built to create a reinforcing narrative that would increasingly uh, convince people of what Franklin Graham, frankly, uh, uh, says all the time now, which is that uh, any progressive, any Democrat, anyone who doesn't fit this particular uh, vision of what the Republican Party must represent in public life is not just, in his opinion, wrong, but is, uh, as he often says, uh, atheist. It is anti-God. So this is the context, as you know, in which we are living and in which we are trying to be church and uh, in which we are struggling for the very heart of our democracy in the country right now. And in the midst of that, I think it's incredibly important for us to recognize not only that this movement exists and has existed for a long time and has made its design to hold together a coalition of, of white voters over and against an increasingly brown electorate for the past 50 years, but that at the very same time, there has always been another moral voice, that there has always been another way of reading scripture, that there are other values that people hold dear and that people vote. And I think the scholarship on Christian nationalism is so incredibly important because what, what uh, uh, Perry and Whitehead's work reveals is that the Christian nationalist narrative, which this movement has worked so hard to push and to make the uh, uh, dominant religious voice in public life, uh, despite uh, all of that investment, is nowhere near a majority opinion. Uh, in their analysis, um, less than 20% of Americans are uh, what they call ambassadors, people who fully embrace this narrative. Um, part of the power of the narrative, though, is that there's about another 30% of the population that um, is willing to accommodate this narrative. That is, um, you know, I know that there are people in our families, people in our churches, people uh, who have um, enthusiastically embraced this understanding of uh, what it means to be Christian in America, and we have been willing to go along with that. Um, we have been uh, in an effort to keep the peace, uh, in an effort to uh, uh, not stir up too much trouble, uh, or maybe sometimes in an effort to say, well, maybe there's something to what they're saying. We've gone along with it. And uh, part of the crisis that I think we face right now is that uh, folks who've fallen into that accommodationist uh, position are really having to decide, uh, are having to make a decision 
about whether we are willing to interrupt the um, habits and the relationships of our lives to say uh, that as a matter of fact, we cannot go along with caging children. Uh, we cannot go along with deregulating corporations that are literally destroying the world. Uh, we cannot go along with the kind of uh, attacks on uh, black and brown people that have become normal in um, the presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, that's the moment we're in. And in that moment, I think for people who have seen and heard this happening for 40 years, it's really important that we listen to those voices of people who have been reading the scriptures, uh, not from a position of power, uh, that people who have been reading the scriptures as the victims of this kind of politics for decades. Um, and uh, so the other side of what I try to do in, in Revolution of Values is to tell the stories of people I have met, people who have been harmed by the politics that uh, I grew up in and was groomed in. Uh, but in knowing them, I have learned from them another way of reading scripture. A story I tell early in the book is uh, how back in 2017, a group down at the border in El Paso, Texas, invited uh, me and others to come and join them for what they called Hugs Not Walls. Uh, this was, you know, after the uh, election where there had been so much talk about building a wall uh, when the administration was still trying to figure out, you know, ways that they could um, uh, take money that had been appropriated for other things to uh, build sections of the wall. Um, this grassroots group in El Paso and that stretches across Texas and into New Mexico, um, a group of uh, led mostly by women, uh, many of them Catholic church women, uh, who in their communities had been organizing and trying to uh, hold their families together and resist the uh, illegal searches and seizures that often happen when Border Patrol would raid neighborhoods and houses. Um, this group had, had uh, really recognized their own power, their power to organize and to, and to challenge uh, breaches of the law by officers of the law. And in the course of that, they had developed a relationship with Border Patrol and invited us in to be part of a reunion that they had uh, negotiated. Uh, they said to Border Patrol, when they started uh, talking to them about abuses of the law, they said, as we understand that your job is to make sure that people who are on that side stay on that side and people who are on this side stay on this side. Border Patrol said, that's right. They said, okay, tell us where the line is. They said, what do you mean? They said, the line that, that, that we can't cross. They said, well, the, the line's in the middle of the river. And they said, well, if we met in the middle of the river with our family that we've been separated from on the other side, could we... Uh, uh, could we meet there as long as we both went back uh, to our respective sides? And, and Border Patrol said, well, there's no law against that. And so uh, they uh, met us on a Sunday morning early, and uh, we went from the U.S. side down to the river with Border Patrol, uh, watching the whole time. And um, a woman named Maria invited me to walk with her uh, to the middle of the river where there was a little sandbar, and we stood on that sandbar, and from the other side, her husband, who had been deported uh, earlier that year by the Trump administration, and two of her sons, one of whom she said she had not seen in 17 years, they made their way down into the river and across to uh, the little sandbar we were standing on. And, and there in the middle, they had a, a little reunion. Uh, it only lasted about 10 minutes before Border Patrol said we had to uh, separate and go back to our different sides. But as I sat on the riverbank putting my shoes back on and, and, and reflecting on what I had seen, on the determination of someone like Maria uh, to, uh, to be pro-family in the very concrete sense of trying to keep her family together in a country where extreme immigration enforcement and a very confusing uh, a system of uh, immigration laws has left uh, uh, not just a, a city there on the border uh, divided, uh, but also 
thousands of families like hers uh, separated in, in ways that are just heart-wrenching when you meet the people uh, who were just trying to live their lives. Uh, and this border has been written across their lives and politicized in such a way that the very real needs of these uh, faithful, normal people uh, are not even part of the conversation. Um, I looked up after uh, we had finished there and over on the Mexican side of the border, there's a mountain and on the side of that mountain in, in white rocks, someone has uh, written out in Spanish, the Bible is the word of God, read it. And as I reflected on that experience for me of being invited into the literal struggle for the holding together of a family uh, by fellow Christians who, who want to find a way to be uh, pro-family uh, uh, in the midst of uh, a nation and a political situation that has separated their family, I realized how important it is for me and for the whole church to go back and to read the scriptures again with people like them. And so on each issue that this uh, book covers on uh, a whole array of issues in our public life, I share the story of someone like Maria who has experienced uh, the, the real violence of uh, the politics that the religious right has enabled. And then I read the Bible again with them and through their eyes on that particular issue. So I wanted to uh, close just by reading uh, the, the chapter on uh, immigration rights uh, in which I tell the story of a pastor, Jose Chicas, who uh, has been here in my home state of North Carolina. Uh, he's lived here since the mid-80s uh, when he fled El Salvador during the Civil War. And uh, he has been uh, registered and in regular communication with ICE since ICE was established under the George Bush administration. But at his first ICE meeting during the Trump administration, he was told that he had to leave the country. Uh, and uh, because he pastors a church here, because he owns a home here, because his whole family is here, the, his wife and the children he raised here in North Carolina, uh, he chose to take sanctuary and uh, from that place of sanctuary has been reading the scriptures not only with his congregation but with a growing community of people who are coming to see the bible anew through his eyes and so uh, here's a couple pages from the end of that chapter on how he's reading the bible each morning at 4 30 a.m pastor jose logs on to facebook live to read scripture and pray with his flock which has grown during his confinement to include people all over the world. He's often drawn to the Exodus story, connecting his experience in sanctuary with both enslaved Hebrews in ancient Egypt and enslaved Africans who heard echoes of their own experience in the Exodus story. The Lord will fight for you, Pastor Jose reads, imagining Moses up against the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army at his back. Like Moses, Jose feels stuck with no home to go back to and no legal status with which to move forward in America. But his experience, he tells his flock, is one we all face. When we learn from a doctor that we have cancer or when a relationship that has defined us comes to an end. When we know we can't go back and also cannot see a way forward, the Bible's message becomes a promise to cling to. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. In Pastor Jose's preaching, the Bible's concern for immigrants reveals a basic truth about who we are, people who walk by faith, not sight. As Christian nationalists know, memory is essential to, to identity formation. The Bible story begins in an Eden where all is as God meant it to be. But it doesn't teach us to believe we are people who can make creation great again by wrestling control of our common life from our enemies. Instead, the biblical story shapes a memory that we are all in some way people who cannot go home again. In the place where God intends for us to dwell, we are all gear, strangers. We are all illegal. The gift of God isn't that we were born in a great nation, but that God meets us as aliens and strangers and says, you will be my people. 
and I will be your God. Christian nationalism is a heresy not only because it makes people mean to neighbors we're called to love, but also because it reinforces a nativism that lies about who we are. In the Bible's prophetic witness, this idolatry is explicitly connected to public policy that hurts immigrants, widows, and children. God cries out against the political violence that always accompanies the idolatry of nationalism. You city that brings on herself doom by shedding blood in her midst and defiles herself by making idols, Ezekiel says. See how each of the princes of Israel who are in you uses his power to shed blood. In you they have oppressed the foreigner and mistreated the fatherless and the widow. In the New Testament, Jesus embodies this prophetic witness when he teaches in Matthew 25 that we welcome him, God in human flesh, when we welcome the stranger. Christian nationalists often dismiss this text and the broad prophetic witness by claiming that care for immigrants, like works of charity for, quote, those less fortunate than ourselves, are individual responsibilities, not the work of governmental policy. So Matthew 25 doesn't inform their public policy agenda, but Jesus explicitly confronts the idolatry of policy violence in Matthew 25 when he says nations will be judged by how we treat the stranger, the hungry, the sick, and the imprisoned. No, the Bible doesn't speak directly to the complex immigration policy issues in a 21st century democracy, but when we read scripture with people like Pastor Jose, it does speak pointedly to how the heart of faith is subverted by nativism. In Luke 4, when Jesus offers his first sermon in his own hometown, the text says that all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. His message from the prophet Isaiah had been about the fulfillment of God's promises. But Jesus doesn't bask in the praise of an approving hometown crowd that assumes those promises are for them. Instead, he tells two stories from First and Second Kings about how, in Israel's history, foreigners had received God's blessings when the native-born had been faithless. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Luke 4, 28 records, The violence of religious nationalism is not new. Jesus' neighbors tried to throw him off a cliff when he confronted their nativism with an alternative political memory. The memory of God blessing outsiders fosters a radical hospitality in Scripture that exhorts followers of Jesus' way to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. This welcome is never offered out of a paternalistic largesse. It flows rather from an expectation that God's messengers are people like Pastor Jose. They come to us not because they need our help, but because we need to learn together what it means to be a sanctuary, a community in which God's presence can be known in the fellowship of sisters and brothers who know we've been given to one another as gifts. So my prayer for you as you uh, discuss this workshop with one another, and as you navigate this season with um, fellow Christians in your congregation and in your community, is that you would have the opportunity to listen closely to voices like uh, that of Pastor Jose, to read the Bible with Pastor Jose and millions like him, and in that reading, to hear this invitation to be a sanctuary, not only in our life together, uh, odd as it is now that much of it is online and in virtual forms like this, but, but that we might also be that beloved community in the world and that we might fulfill the responsibility, the civic responsibility of voting the values of that beloved community as we go to the polls here this election year of 2020. Bless y'all. It's good to be with you, and thanks for being part of this workshop.